So um, we're here now for our second panel uh, of our symposium, Art, Labor, and the Future of Work. Um, the first panel, the opening panel this morning, was, uh, was fantastic um, uh, about um, poetry, the author, or uh, uh, producer as author uh, with uh, Mark Novak and Alessandro Capodoni. It's wonderful. So um, now looking forward to uh, our second panel of the day um, entitled Free Associations. Um, our first speaker uh, is a very good friend and collaborator of, of mine, uh, Johan Hartler, um, who uh, will be speaking on um, labor associations. Um, Johan uh, studied philosophy and political science in Marburg. Um, and Frankfurt am Main. Uh, currently teaches philosophy of art at the University uh, of Amsterdam, aesthetics of the political at the University of Art and Design, Karlsruhe, and art and theory, or an art theory at the China Academy uh, of Arts in Hang Hangzhou. He held research fellowships at the University of Amsterdam, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, um, the M University of Rome, and taught at the Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam and the Academy of Fine Arts, Münster, Westphalia, and, and other art schools. Um, we have, of course, uh, collaborated a number of things uh, together, including um, our uh, two uh, edited volumes that just came out uh, this past uh, um, year and, and, and a half. Um, the first being a Spell of uh, Capital, Reification, and uh, Spectacle, and also uh, Aesthetic um, Marks. And in, indeed, it's that latter book that is in some way a kind of inspiration for uh, this symposium here, where we're really trying to um, think through some of the, um, the, 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 the concepts and, and, and theoretical framework that we um, started to uh, really put together in the introduction of that book. And we were hoping to um, uh, put together uh, an, another project on, on the question of organization. And so this conference is just a kind of preliminary step of, of getting some conversations going. Um, so we're very excited about that. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Johan, who will be beaming in from Karlsruhe. Greetings, Johan. Yeah. Um, thank you, Samir. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm basically speaking to the door now. I don't see anyone, but I guess you can see me. And um, yeah, I have changed my title a little bit. The new title now is a Marxian version of free association, um, alluding to a formulation of Frederick James. Uh, because in his discussion of Alexander Kluge's attempt to renew Sergei Eisenstein's project to turn Marx's capital into a film, Frederick Jameson finds in both of their cinematographic programs a, quote, Marxian version of free association. What, according to Jameson, Eisenstein has had in mind, and Kluge brings to the fore, is the attempt to loosely connecting surface phenomena of everyday life through which elements of the latent structure of social production will become visible. As Jameson writes, I quote, it is at this point that we glimpse what Eisenstein really has in mind here, something like a Marxian version of Freudian free association. The chain of hidden links that leads us from the surface of everyday life and experience to the very sources of production itself. Especially in the context of the concrete analysis of either Eisenstein or Kluge, this is a very sharp remark. It emphasizes the ontological distinction between the latent and the manifest which connects Marx with Freud, and which makes perfect sense as a means of analyzing concrete cultural objects, I think. What Jameson conceals from his readers, however, is that Marx already had his own version of free association long before psychoanalytical readings could have been applied to his work. Marx regularly discusses the association of free and equal producers as a form of a self-governed societal order operating independently from repressive state apparatuses and the predominance of commodity fetishism. The latter, of course, being a regime of representation that represses the self-organization and even the perceptibility of labor. For Marx, the apparent universality of state and capital conceal the driving forces of basic bourgeois class structure and hamper the cognition of the relations of production. 
By referring to the organizational forms of associations, Marx alludes to labor's possibility to present itself in a form that avoids the forms of political alienation identified in the dominant regimes of social representation in both state and capital. In the following, I would briefly like to sketch the ways in which Marx, against the background of the history of labor struggles and its theories, speaks about association. Much in the way, so I believe, in which Jameson discusses the Marxian version of free association in Eisenstein and Kluger, Marx already has his own version of it. And because of its specific way to articulate and, articulate and organize labor, is a very specific form of self-regulation, I will try to argue that Marx's idea of association already contains some central elements of the aesthetic. So first part, associations in labor history. Let's shortly look back into the history of emancipatory social philosophy and the history of labor struggles. It is with Rousseau that the term association will first be introduced to social philosophy. Rousseau uses the term to positively describe the link between free or possible link between free and equal citizens. In the second discourse, Rousseau speaks of, quote, free associations which oblige none of its members, end quote, as a form of a somewhat utopian or at least promising form of societal organization. In the contrat social, it will be the contract itself that constitutes the association of a free society. And in both cases, the term association appears to describe a self-determined connectivity of the members of a free and equal society. With this tradition, the term association slowly gains specific connotations. They are linked to the idea, obviously, of an emancipated society. After Rousseau, Claude Saint-Simon and Charles Fourier specified egalitarian forms of organization as association. Saint-Simon reflected on the term or the very phenomenon of, of association as the form of organization of the class productif, a professional organization for scientists, artists and workers that should in the end reorganize society. Beyond social atomism and beyond market and state, associations were considered as intrinsic systems of social organization and connectivity that would adequately represent the productive classes of society. The idea of an association of producers who would, quote, work together and market their goods in common, end quote, was also the central idea to Fourier's utopianism. Association for Fourier, Saint-Simon, and their aftermath stood for an alternative form of a social bond, and such associations were meant to connect the separated, separated fields of social production directly, independently of the mediation through the market. Partly independently of the theoretical efforts of early socialists, so-called associations became the central element in the working class's actual self-organization on the ground. Strikes during the French Revolution of 1830, for example, engendered a movement committed to the ideals of associationism, which became the central term for the self-understanding of a movement. As Bernard H. Moss writes, associations were, I quote, originally designed with the expanding funds of collective capital to ensure the continual admission of new members without capital and to emancipate the entire trade." End quote. In 1848, Paris alone hosted around 300 of such associations with, with approximately 50,000 members collectively. The idea of common labor and self-organized associations, an idea that Charles Fourier had originally conceived for agricultural contexts, will become the leading slogan for urban craftsmen and the organization of the industrial working class in the early and decisive years of struggle. Second part, Marx's use of the term association. Marx refers to these historical connotations in his use of the term as well. Famously so in the Communist Manifesto, quote, in place of the old bourgeois society, with its classes and class antagonisms, so Marx and Engels write, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. And in The Poverty of Philosophy, Marx writes, quote, 
The working class, in the course of its development, will substitute for the old civil society an association, so a certain type of uh, societal organization will be substituted with an association which will exclude classes and their antagonisms, and there will be no more political power properly so-called. So no alienated political power independent of the self-organization of this, as he calls it, association. This form of organization will develop by spreading the idea and political form of association as broadly as possible. It's an inclusive and basically universal principle of social organization. Marx and Engels emphasize in the Communist Manifesto that with the bourgeois order, a relation, a relation between the laborers emerges as its imminent product, something that is already present in a latent form. I quote, the advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to, guess what, association, end quote. Marx, as you see, quite regularly uses the term association when he emphasizes the anti-statist aim of the socialist movement. It articulates a form of politics that cannot be alienated. It is a direct form of the satisfaction of need, and, so, and, and as such, associations avoid for, further organs of um, abstract political or social representation. In another famous quote from the 1850 address to the Central Committee of the Communist League, Marx formulates that associations will have to make the revolution permanent until all the more or less property classes have been forced out of their position of, position of dominance, the proletariat has conquered state power, and the association of proletarians, not only in one country but in all the dominant countries of the world, has advanced so far that at least the decisive productive forces are concentrated in the hands of the proletarians." End quote. Time and again, as you see, association describes a form of societal organization that functions as means and end for the egalitarian organization of society. From the German ideology and the Communist Manifesto to the third volume of Capital, and famously so, of course, in the fetishism chapter in the first volume of Capital, where Marx speaks of the Verein Freier Menschen, translated as Association of Free Men, just as much as in Engels' later writings, this particular use of the term association can be found as a description of socialist politics and the working class self-organization, which transgressive, uh, transgresses sorry, the repressive and alienated organizational forms of state and capital. Wherever Marx speaks about the organization of a future society, this particular term is used to characterize the free and non-coercive form of social, social bonds and social forms of organization through which, through which goods are collectively produced and freely distributed. What Marx finds in the loose and voluntary structure of association is thus a description of the collective potential of workers to communally manage the production and distribution of material wealth on a small and large scale. And that which is normally concealed by the socially necessary illusion generated by the commodity form, labor, itself now gains visibility and autonomy in and through these specific forms of self-organization. When sketching outlines of a future society, Marx thus confronts the institutional spheres of state and capital with such capacity of material production to self-organize. And I'm coming to my third and last part the aesthetic of material self-regulation. If Jameson is right, and I think he is, bringing labor to visibility, articulating the latent, is much of an aesthetic practice. The Marxian version of free association, according to Jameson, is a form of cinematic montage which allows to reflect upon the hidden logics of social production. The question remains, however, why such Marxian associationism would have to move through the history of cinema to come to itself, which sounds a little bit like a detour through spectacle. Yeah? Isn't the presentation of the latent structures of production precisely what Marx expects from labor associations already? Even without any kind of cinema being involved, associations, so Marx writes, um, help to overcome the isolation of the worker 
true revolutionary organization. Association is thus a free form of coordination as it helps to organize an intrinsic link that might otherwise be repressed. An intrinsic link or a specific form of solidarity that is latently already present in the specific form of the organization of production. In and through associations, the sphere of symbolic representation, the specific forms of um, societal organization that are dominant in bourgeois society, state and capital, are being confronted with a hidden dynamic of production. In labor struggles, production articulates um, itself in a way that is normally excluded from an apparent logic of representation. And to my mind, this structure of reshaping the systems of representation can be called aesthetic. It can be called aesthetic as it articulates and organizes material dynamics that are normally repressed in the dominant or the cliché forms of social representation. And this understanding of the aesthetic is determined by at least three dimensions. The first dimension would be the dimension of mediation between the material and the symbolic. In Marxist terminology, the association of workers avoids the flaws of the bourgeois state by bringing economic production and political organization, indeed a form of uh, symbolic practice and for better or worse representation, directly together. It helps articulating labor directly without separating the logics of material production from the sphere of politics, yeah, which we find um, ideal typically in um, the discourse of Hannah Arendt or Jürgen Habermas by separating work or labor from action or interaction. Associations avoid this. Yeah? And this is a somewhat aesthetic practice as it basically reconciles the material with the symbolic. The second dimension of this, uh, of the second aesthetic dimension um, that I would like to outline is the dimension of articulating re the repressed in free and intrinsic forms of connectivity in free and intrinsic ways. So associations establish an order based on the inherent affinities of the concealed logics of material production. Secretly, latently, the potentialities of the social producers are already connected, despite the way in which they might appear isolated as individual commodity owners or bearers of rights yeah, to uh, the market or the state. It is the aesthetic, aesthetic method of free association that lays bare the inner connectivity of the various the inner connectivity of the various parts of social production. The particular dynamic and quality of labor associations is, in other words, to organize social elements that in the dominant or say manifest structure of representation appear as isolated. And the third dimension of the aesthetic that I find here is the dimension of opening up new horizons of meaningful practice. Obviously, labor associations open up new dimensions of social life by rearranging the conditions for social production. The satisfaction of social needs can directly be addressed in and through their collective articulation through new forms of self-organization. By addressing the field of social production directly, associations help to imagine and produce new forms and conditions of social life. In other words, labor associations are means of poetic production, which articulate the forces of, a, of an otherwise merely latent structure of social production. These three dimensions are aesthetic, interpretive, productive of meaning, which again has to be understood in its openness without being arbitrary or deductive, and rooted in the gray zones of symbolic representation. With the idea of association then, the politics of the aesthetic appears as a concrete logic of disorganization and organization that also allows us to rethink the historical function of the aesthetic and its relation to the political in more concrete terms, without merely repeating the forms of aesthetic or political alienation. And this is how the logics of labor association lays bare, to quote Jameson again, the quote that I've used at the very beginning, Quote, the chain of hidden links that leads us from the surface of everyday life and experience to the very sources of production itself. Thank you. Thank you so much, Johan. That was great. Um, so now we move on to our second speaker, um, 
and that's Dwayne Fontaine, uh, just to my immediate left, uh, who is a professional accountant and is currently a PhD student in uh, SFU's um, Special Arrangements Program. He's studying the nature of work in contemporary society and is c in contrasting it with an examination of alternative visions um, for the future of work. The widespread application of robotics, automation, and artificial intelligence into the productive economy threatens the future of work. Duane is revisiting the utopian quest for an aesthetic state and how its em emancipatory potential combined with such transitional solutions as universal basic income might present an opportunity to redefine the very nature and purpose of work in a way that enhances meaning and freedom. Um, and the title of Duane's talk today, this morning, will be the UBI subject, the new proletariat or forgotten rabble. Take it away. Okay, so I want to talk um, today uh, about work from a utopian perspective, um, one that hopefully will stoke our imagination through the application of um, a more eudaimonic or aesthetic normative standards rather than our current um, uh, supposedly value-neutral utilitarianism. Uh, what might we, we wish for as a society if we could democratically choose how technology is to be developed and applied? What possibilities might life offer us if our basic necessities were taken care of by technology? Would the resulting drop in socially necessary work lead to indolence, loss of meaning, and perhaps even social decay? Or might it open up new possibilities for the enhancement of individual freedoms? I want to put forward the notion that the direction society takes hinges on the outcome of two important sites of conflict. First, who ultimately will define the nature, quantity, and ownership of work in the future? And how will we utilize the increased free time if indeed that comes to pass? So in answering the first question, I believe that it's important to consider who the agent of change might be in bringing about a progressive redefinition of work. So let me state up. Would you mind just speaking to the microphone? Right. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let me just state up front that it is my position that the recipient group of uh, um, well-designed and progressive uh, basic income might be that new collective agent of change. Um, in the context of a future um, with insufficient employment opportunities, the traditional working class will continue to shrink in number and in power. Um, the BI recipient, on the other hand, might be granted the opportunity to develop a greater sense of agency and power arising out of his or her release from a primary focus on necessity. Um, second, I'll try to defend a position that uh, work must be continue to be the primary focus. Um, some progressive advocates for basic income in their various forms argue that the primary benefit of, of uh, basic income and of automation is the opportunity to abandon work altogether in, in favor of greater leisure time. So my view is that a focus on leisure would run counter to those progressive goals of enhancing human freedom a sole focus on leisure uh, threatens a retrenchment of atomistic behavior and consumerism. Under this scenario, I think it's quite possible that a typical BI recipient would become even more susceptible to the repressive desublimation that Herbert Marcuse warns us of. An environment of collective pacification through the manipulation and alienation of our libidinal forces. Both Hegel and Marx recognize the important role that creative work plays in shaping our subjectivity. It is the mutual recognition of the other by means of the exchange of objects of our own creation that we come to see ourselves as true subjects, as self-aware beings with agency and a sense of purpose. Finally, I'll present an argument in favor of a very specific articulation of work that I think has great emancipatory potential namely the notion of work as aesthetic play. And uh, to do this, I'll draw upon uh, Friedrich Schiller's On the Aesthetic Education of Man, as well as Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization. Um, before I consider in more detail the philosophical foundations of my position, though, I think it's worthwhile to outline 
very briefly where we stand with work today. I think we're all aware of this. Um, we have uh, an increase in unemployment, in precarious work, and I, I think um, that this is a very real possibility of this continuing. Um, in, in addition, the future will likely see the extinction of a, a, a broad range of occupations and professions due to the increasing role of robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, defenders of the status quo, uh, primarily from uh, the economics profession, um, would probably counter that no, we'll actually see an increase uh, uh, in creative fulfilling uh, jobs, and they'll quite rightly reference um, evidence to the past where such waves of innovation have indeed eventually um, fostered new jobs. But I think the um, a more, a deductive uh, argument against that is that um, the, this time it just might actually be different. Each previous wave of innovation replaced lost jobs by drawing upon some previously underutilized human potential. But our current environment um, might be different be due to the very nature of those um, upcoming technologies of artificial intelligence and robotics. Um, AI programs, for example, have been shown to perform feats of problem solving and uh, autonomous learning that are beginning to challenge our cognitive supremacy. Um, However, rather than feeling hopeless in the face of these impending changes, I believe that we do have reason for optimism. We're, in the cusp on, we're now on the cusp of a moment in history where the emancipatory potential of technology actually might be within our reach. And even Marx himself hinted at this potential in this short, um, short paragraph I'm going to read from Grundrisse. Capital employs machinery rather only to the extent that it enables the worker to work a larger part of his time for capital. To relate to a larger part of his time as time which does not belong to him to work longer for another. Through this process, the amount of labor necessary for the production of a given object is indeed reduced to a minimum, but only in order to realize a maximum of labor and the maximum number of such objects. The first aspect is important, but because capital here quite unintentionally reduces human labor expenditure of energy to a minimum. This will redound to the benefit of emancipated labor and is the condition of its emancipation. So technological advancement, of course, is no guarantee of emancipation. Um, its potential is limited by who owns and controls it. This is why I think we need to identify the key agent of change within our current system, one that is deeply intertwined with the productive capacities of society, um, but yet is not fully enslaved by those very same processes and relations. Well, I believe that we may be beyond the window of opportunity for a working, traditional working class revolutionary moment um, we are not beyond our capacity to create a new and perhaps broader revolutionary class. And this, this um, position is supported by Michael Hart and Antonio Negri in their book Empire, where they, they themselves posit a new subject or collection aid, uh, collective agent of change, uh, which they call the multitude. Uh, this globalized multitude represents a multi-ethnic and multi-constituent group which, while diverse and geographically separated, um, builds solidarity around a common interest in equality and the opportunity to pursue a happy and meaningful life. So while the uh, realm of work within the capitalist system has in the past been the primary locus of identity and social recognition, um, the changing context of work in our day might challenge the dominant status of the proletariat. Um, Basic income schemes offer, I think, the possibility of a cascading progression towards greater freedoms. Progressives need to take back the banner of freedom, I believe, that the right has so successfully co-opted. The progressive vision of freedom, which incorporates both negative and positive freedoms, is a more complete one. Negative freedoms alone have no content. The freedom gained from not having to worry about uh, providing for basic necessities might up, open up higher freedoms, such as the ability to add the aesthetic dimension to life. 
And this is where my second point comes in. Assuming that we are successful as a society in implementing a progressive BI program and in establishing a new freedom from work, how will we use that free time? John Maynard Keynes was also concerned about this question. In his essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, 1930, he suggested that once absolute needs uh, were fully addressed throughout all of society by means of increased efficiency and productivity, any subsequent gains would result in a shift of human activities away from work and toward non-economic activities. In fact, Keynes um, forecasted a reduction of the work week to just 15 hours by the year 2030. So while Keynes is often presented as the economist who uh, put a human face on capitalism, his policy proposals for state intervention in the economy were modest and they were meant to only be temporary. Um, and they were meant to temper capitalism, not dismantle it. His main concern, concern, according to Jeff Mann in his book, In the Long Run, We Are All Dead, was the protection of civilization against the revolutionary impulses of a disenfranchised, unemployed rabble. Employment in the interventions that, and the interventions that the state should use to blunt the destructive effects of the business cycle, and thus keep employment high, were Keynes main focus. Keynes was also concerned that the desire for the secondary satisfaction of relative needs, those needs that relate to status, or in his words, that satisfy the desire for superiority, would indeed prove to be insatiable, and that they would thus derail pro um, progressive tendencies towards less work. It is here in the attitude that less work and more leisure time is what society should strive toward, toward that reform-minded tendencies working within the capitalist framework will likely fail. We can see the utilitarian rational choice mentality at work here, as well as the assumed antagonisms between the work versus leisure trade-off that forms part of the foundation of neoclassical economics. It should come as no surprise to the student of Marxist critique of capitalism that the majority of the incremental value arising out of the increased efficiency that I just mentioned accrues to the capitalist and not in the work, worker in the form of a shorter work week. It should come as no surprise that the shift in economic activity today is toward the cyclical creation of desire and its associated but never quite sufficient satisfaction of that desire. This insatiable drive to consume out of an ever-present urge to satiate desire originates from repressed libidinal drives, according to Marcuse. And these drives serve the interest of capital, but yet are maladaptive on so many other fronts, not least of which are mental health, social injustice, and environmental destruction. So as I'll discuss shortly, work in a non-alienated form through its sublimated aesthetic expression is the key to satisfying the relative needs of humans. So then, let's elaborate on this. If not in leisure, how is our free time to be used? In defining the qualities of this new approach to work, uh, as, uh, as mentioned, I'll draw heavily upon Schiller and Marcuse. Schiller's construction of the play drive is achieved through a dialectical resolution of the sense, or the material drive, and then on the formal drive. In Schiller's system, these fundamental human drives represent two distinct orientations to the world, with the sense drive moving towards sensuous or bodily engagement with the world, and the form drive moving towards bringing structures and, and uh, uh, categories. In Schiller's system, the resolution of these two drives is an emergent drive, a third drive called the play drive. The clearest example of this emergent drive is our sense of beauty, which is defined as the merger of sensuous form and matter. While neither Marcuse nor Schiller value work for work's sake, Schiller feels that play can and should take on a work-like form. <coughs> Excuse me. Not as an instrumentality, but yet as a serious yet purposeless pursuit. 
It is a form of work that takes skill, dedication, and attention to detail seriously, but is done solely with reference to itself and not some other end. This means and uh, distinction, however, is not to be confused with another emergent, um, emergent property from play, where according to Schiller it becomes an activity linked to a higher form of necessity. And Schiller's higher form of necessity includes the following. Realization of, or of an organic moral community, the production and maintenance of the self, and a new way of living which realizes human potential. So for me, as a student of Aristotle, this description appears to have direct links to Aristotle's notion of the good life, or eudaimonia, as he outlines in the Nicomachean Ethics. In Eros and Civilization, Herbert Marcuse builds upon Schiller's idea of play, uh, but brings Freud's psychodynamic ontology into his formulation. Marcuse builds upon the relationship and tension between Freud's reality principle, that form of behavior that is driven by the repression of the id in order to survive within civilization, and his pleasure principle, the original id and its instincts. And he posits two additional principles, one, surplus repression, and two, the performance principle. One might summarize the performance principle as the form of living that is required within our current capitalist system, which is stratified by class, which is competitive, and hierarchically structured. It requires a level of, sorry, yep. Is that good? Okay. I hope so. Okay. It requires a level of repression that exceeds that of pre-capitalist civilization and is thus labeled surplus repression. It goes beyond normal repression of the instinctual drives by forcing humans into modes of living and behaving that facilitate capitalist production. Surplus repression can also be seen to operate in our daily lives as behaviors, compulsiveness, neuroses even, and fantasies that enable us to cope with alienation, hierarchy, and the undemocratic management of our working environment. Marcuse departs from Freud's thinking with respect to pleasure. Freud believes that the reali reality principle is already a state of suppressed libidinal pleasure. Marcuse, on the other hand, believes that is, it is only surplus repression that needs to be eliminated in order to experience a return to libidinal pleasure in the aesthetic dimension. It is not difficult to discern the implications, I think, of Marcuse's viewpoint um, a release from surplus repression enables a return to the pleasure principle without the necessity. That's okay. It's just, yeah, that didn't solve the problem. It only made it worse. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Um, uh, sir, okay, well, I'll start back again. Marcus, on the other hand, believes that it is only surplus repression that needs to be eliminated in order uh, to experience a return to libidinal pleasure and the ascetic dimension. Right, so it's not difficult to discern the implications of Marcuse's viewpoint. Release from surplus repression enables a return to the pleasure principle without the necessity of abandoning civilization, which would be the implication from Freud's theory. So this is admittedly a utopian vision, but one I think that points towards the emancipatory potential of a new form of work modeled after the play drive. However, the implications of Marcuse's viewpoint is the requirement to dismantle not only the source of sur or to dismantle the source of surplus repression um, and the performance principle, namely the capitalist system itself. So, just to conclude. How do these views and the aesthetic dimension tie into the desirability of, uh, of a progressive basic income in one form or another? I believe it comes down to the two main sources of emancipation that uh, we might achieve through BI. Number one is the power of exit, the power to the ability to, to choose other work and the sense of autonomy and self-determination that that provides. And secondly, the opportunity to explore the unalienated self through greater free time. 
So true free time, in other words, is time that is neither defined by the productive mandates of our employer, nor by the associated cultural abstractions of leisure time, as it's traditionally, def excuse me, traditionally defined. Um, it opens up a window for self-reflection, uh, for a reconnection with our libidinal nature, and for a desire to be a fully embodied participant in life rather than just a spectator. So here's Herbert Marcuse on this sentiment. The individual is not to be left alone, for left to itself and supported by a free intelligence aware of the potentialities of liberation from the reality of repression, the libidinal energy generated by the id would thrust against it ever larger field of existential relations, thereby exploding the reality ego and its repressive performances. So it's important for us not to overstate the case for BI. There's no guarantees that it'll be uh, politically feasible to implement, um, particularly in its more progressive forms. Furthermore, there are no guarantees that if a progressive BI is instituted, that it will foster a movement towards solidarity and collective action. Nevertheless, I remain hopeful that the experience that one obtains upon being granted uh, the freedom of exit from alienated work and combined with the opportunity to freely choose work that is creative might foster a collective political movement to expand those very same freedoms. That's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dwayne. Um, Dwayne was actually one of the, uh, the panelists addressing John Clark, and as you may have guessed, he, uh, he spoke uh, in favor of BI and, and mounted a pretty good challenge to uh, Clark's very strong arguments. Um, so, last but not least, um, gives me tremendous pleasure to uh, uh, welcome uh, Philip Olstetter to, uh, to the podium and, uh, and also to Vancouver again. Um, I met Philip uh, last uh, May during um, this wonderful event that, uh, that he organizes called Red May, and I, I encourage everybody to, to check it out and, and uh, possibly even go down um, Please come. and participate. Uh, so uh, Philip is uh, co-founder of Invisible Seattle, a loose group of actors, artists, dancers, and writers specializing in demystifications to order, trials of the enemies of civil life, civic life, and strategic interventions. Uh, the first novel written by an entire city, which um, related very much relates very much to the panel that we just uh, that we just had uh, this morning. He's currently producing Red May, as already uh, uh, alluded to, uh, a month-long festival in Seattle with two rules: first, riff on red; second, assume that the market is not the solution for the problems uh, the market creates. He was at Columbia University during the exhilarating days of the 1968 takeover and in Santiago, Chile uh, on September 11th, 1973 for the uh, last moments of the Allende government. Uh, he has translated uh, Régis Debray and has been working for 40 years on a book called uh, Valparaiso, uh, which he will probably uh, never finish. Um, and, and the title of, uh, of Philip's um, uh, talk uh, this morning is Robinson at work, my life as a non-value creator. So take it away, Phil. So, you know, first I want to thank uh, both Johan and, and Duane for two incredible talks that really uh, mesh very well into what I will be trying to do and even encourage me to try to reframe it as I go along. We'll see how successful that is. And, and I absolutely want to thank Samir uh, for inviting me to do this. This is a a work in progress that I st that wasn't making much progress until uh, last week when uh, Samir gave the invitation to sort of kick my ass into motion. Um, I came up with the idea five years ago. It's kind of a, a half of a writing, half of a conceptual art project. The idea was to take every job I ever had and try to find one moment, describe one moment in the job, and see if I can use that moment to lay bare the chain of hidden links that lead us from the surface of everyday life and experience to very sources and structures of production. Uh, that in any way is the goal. The attempt is to write it in uh, a sort of a neutral style, degree zero of writing and so forth. And you know, in a project like this, uh, there are, I think, four temptations or lapses that it can fall into that deviate out of that very 
narrow range where it can, it can work. The first thing is that it becomes uh, a, a building's roman. It becomes sort of about a character who is going through a, a series of learning experiences through work, and you move towards novel. The second thing is it becomes an act of Cartesian formalism. By examining myself, I come up with universal ideas about the world and so forth. The third is it, it, it can lead to a lapse into anecdote, uh, particularly when one goes back to work and thinks of all the good stories that are associated with these jobs. So something will be in there that's a good story, rather than actually laying bare any kind of structures. And the fourth temptation is that when you're writing to pull it all together, you reach for literary devices to unify it, uh, and, and you grope for literature to take it out of that kind of neutral tone. And, and I believe that I have actually uh, fallen into all these traps as I go through to a greater or lesser extent. Uh, and I think some of these things will be more uh, uh, successful than others. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, there were like 40 jobs or job-like experiences that were going to be the basis of it. And there are about six or seven in here. And some of the ones I've written out before for like about being literary workers and collective things or working as a telephone lineman are not in there just because I didn't get to them. So here we go. It's called Robinson at Work, um, Life as a Non-Value Creator. Okay. Uh, one, Robinson was looking for a job with downtime, lots of it. He was trying to explain this to a friend of his father, to a man who owned a chain of movie theaters. Night clerks, security guards, he said, there were a lot of jobs like that, including the ticket takers in Glaston movie theater box offices. Between shows, when they weren't selling tickets, you saw them reading Dostoevsky or Sartre. That's the job he wanted, one where he could read a lot of books. So you want a job, said the movie exhibitor with barely suppressed rage, where you don't have to work? No, 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 said Robinson, groping to make it sound better. What he wanted was, was two. Adam Smith. In the first fire engines, a boy was constantly employed to open and shut alternately the communication between the boiler and the cylinder, according as the piston either ascended or descended. One of those boys observed that by tying a string from the handle of the valve which opened the communication to another part of the machine, it would open and shut without his assistance and leave him at liberty to divert himself with his playfellows. One of the greatest improvements that has been made upon this machine since it was first invented was in this manner the discovery of a boy who wanted to save his own labor. Three, what Robinson wanted was to get the job done and then divert himself with his playfellows, Dostoevsky and Sartre. Four, Marx writes, labor power can appear on the market as a commodity only if and in so far as its possessor, the individual whose labor power it is, offers it for sale or sells it as a commodity. Neither Robinson nor the movie exhibitor had read that sentence. Only one of them would have understood it. Robinson began his job interview believing, A, that there was a job called movie ticket seller, B, that this job could be broken down into a series of innumerable tasks, i.e., tearing tickets, making change, giving showtimes, attending to the booth, etc. C, that he, Robinson, would contract to do this job, that he would sell to the exhibitor the quantity of labor necessary to fulfill these tasks, and even to fulfill them with care and enthusiasm, <clears throat> in exchange for an agreed upon sum of money. He was, unknown to himself, a disciple of Adam Smith. The outraged movie exhibitor was instinctively Marxist. Without having read either Das Kapital or Le Le Kapital, he clearly grasped A, the difference between labor and labor power, and B, that he was buying the latter, that after the tickets had been sold, Robinson should clean the bathroom, or fetch an espresso for his wife, or do 10 push-ups on the floor of the lobby, whatever the hell he was told to do while under contract, because why else would people call it wage slavery? <laughs> Five. Robinson didn't get the whole work thing. His first job was in the mailroom of a Wall Street brokerage house. He thought, this is it? This is what I do all day? This is what going to the office means? This was moving papers around. He couldn't see the point of it. Six, Robinson was doing care work. He was working as an orderly at a private hospital on the Upper East Side. 
His job description seems straightforward enough. A, transfer stroke patients from their beds to a wheelchair. B, wheel them down the long corridors, or if needed, into an elevator. C, deliver them to the physical therapy center. D, repeat the steps in inverse order. There was even a prospect of extended downtime, since in those days, the production of health had yet to be rationalized, and the coercive laws of competition barely registered within the walls of the hospital. His boss, an amiable Welshman, never assigned him make work or demanded he look busy whenever his services were needed. Was this the job Robinson was looking for? Not exactly. True, he was allowed, even encouraged, to sit and read while his charge was slowly guided through the motions he or she would never fully recover. But this became harder to do when he began to know his patients. And even for a youth as young and fit as Robinson, moving a human being unable to move from a bed to a wheelchair without dropping them was nerve-wracking. He dropped someone his first week, an overweight 70-year-old woman. He couldn't find any place to grasp on her body. His hands kept sliding off. He apologized. He said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. But she couldn't answer, since her vocal cords didn't work anymore. Somehow, he dragged her back onto the bed. <clears throat> There's a great future in healthcare, Robinson read recently. Service jobs are trending up as manufacturing jobs disappear. He's also read that 80% of all jobs, including healthcare, will be automated within the next two decades. He would have been grateful if some version of Adam Smith's valve boy had invented an elder care robot to do the heavy lifting part of the job. But even John Stuart Mill understood that no new labor-saving device had ever lightened the load of labor. Mill had no clue as to why this might be. Robinson also had difficulty imagining how something like the incessant technological change that capital has depended on to heighten productivity, intensify exploitation, and expand its reproduction could manifest itself in the service sector. Robots could certainly lift patients into wheelchairs, but speeding up delivery would turn the corridors into freeway rush hour or bumper car heaven. Seven, time is money. Was it always money? If not, when did it become money? And what was it before? What will it become after it is money? Or has it ceased becoming? Eight, he hated to be conflated with that other Robinson, the one he came across in every micro microeconomics textbook, that paragon of rational maximization, that optimal allocator of scarce resources among competing ends, that saver and investor who could calculate the opportunity cost of his every future choice. Sentences like, even Robinson must have looked upon each of his possessions with varying esteem and desire for more, used to drive him up the wall, as if capitalism were something called the economy, a quasi-biological institution that dates to creation, that springs from human nature itself, from our propensity to truck and barter. Do these people talk to anyone but themselves? Nine, Robinson was working as an athletic assistant at an elite private school. He taught the jump shot, conducted layup and fast break drills, and refereed inter-school games. One day, the headmaster told Robinson to shave. He said he'd prefer not to. The razor, he said, caused a rash on his chin. Get a depilatory, said the headmaster. Robinson looked up the word when he got home. He shaved off the beard, leaving only a handlebar mustache. He was fired. Years later, Robinson read that the headmaster had embezzled funds from the school. He was apprehended in Jamaica and brought back in disgrace. 10. Robinson was picking apples in Oroville, Washington. His foreman was named Hawk, a name that might suggest an asshole, a, a testosterone-addled ex-Marine drill sergeant, for example, rather than this slim, modest, leather-faced man who stepped right out of the pages of The Grapes of Wrath, a real Oki from Dust Bowl, Oklahoma, who'd migrated to California during the Depression and who once said to Robinson, everything Steinbeck wrote about us was true. The real asshole was the boss, Bob Thornhill, which is not a surprise given how often the words asshole and boss are synonymous. What was worse was how Bob Thornhill latched onto Robinson, how he assigned him the role of designated confidant only because Robinson was white and educated, and the people Bob Thornhill wanted to demigrate were not. Robinson would return from the orchards late afternoon en route to the wooden sh work shack where he cooked and slept, 
And there would be Bob, hailing him from beside the corral full of prize appaloosas that occupied his attention for most of the daylight hours. Robinson was so exhausted from twisting apples off of vines and tossing them in wooden baskets since 5 a.m. in the morning, he could barely converse. Not a problem. Bob did all the talking anyway, and was always a very under the same story, why Bob Thornhill deserved everything he had. Long ago, he would say, in effect, there were two sorts of people. One sort was hardworking, intelligent, and above all, frugal. The other sort were lazy, lazy, lazy. Now, the intelligent sort saved their money. They put it aside for a rainy day. And the lazy morons, they spent everything they had and more in riotous living. And look what happened. And he would gesture in the general direction of the workers streaming out of the orchard. Black men, Mexican families, pickers from the Colville tribe, white ex-cons who couldn't get any other job. They have to work their asses off all day in the sun just to get enough to eat. And I'm standing here with a beautiful house, a corral of prize appaloosas, and a shiny blue Ford pickup. Maybe not his exact words, but in one form or another, Robinson would hear what Marx calls, quote, the fantasy of the thrifty proto-capitalist over and over again. 11. Robinson was working in a high-end wine store on the Upper East Side. The tasks he had to perform were simple. A, suggest wines. B, ring up sales. C, pack bottles into boxes for mail delivery and send them down the dumbwaiter to the shipping department. D, attend periodic tastings to improve the palate. It was his first retail job. There were moments of joy, selling wine to Tennessee Williams, packing an order for Governor Rockefeller, to which he appended a note in red ink on the back of a vintage chart, remember Attica and may this wine be as bitter to your taste as the blood of those you murdered there. But these moments were few and far between. He was astonished at how much affect he was expected to mobilize to maintain a certain tone. He had to wear a costume, jacket, white shirt, tie. He had to smile and smile and smile again. He had to project a weird com combo of sophistication and unctuousness. This was in the early 70s. The phrase effective labor was not yet in common use, and many salespeople in New York were still allowed to be older and ill-tempered. 12. The film exec said to him, you're fired. Robinson was instructed to gather up his papers and leave. He did. When he reached the front door, the film exec said, you're hired again. He explained that he had just wanted to make a point. Robinson was in hell. He was rewriting a script called Danny's Inferno that was set in hell. Danny being a Vegas singer and abuser of women, given a chance by God to escape eternal damnation by rescuing Beatrice, consigned to hell in error. Robinson, or rather the script he was revising, was also in development hell the Hollywood version of Hegel's Bad Infinity, or Marx's simple reproduction. Even the topography of the room reproduced the endless circuit of futility. Around the oval table, from the film exec to the star, to script assistant number one, to Robinson, to film exec junior, to Robinson's writing partner, to script assistant number two, to the star's lawyer, would go each line of the script to be submitted to microscopic inspection. Is this line funny, the film exec would ask? I think it's funny. Do you think it's funny? And the talking stick would move one seat to the left. When everyone on the assembly line had put in his or her two cents, a vote would be taken, thumbs up or thumbs down, and the circuit would recommence with line number two. Sometimes the inhabitants of the seats would change, mostly when a new writer would be brought in to handle the next few drafts, but the script would never attain the escape velocity necessary to break out of the circuit, much less be made into a movie. Marx writes, <clears throat> Milton, who wrote Paradise Lost, was an unproductive worker. On the other hand, the writer who turns out work for his publisher in factory style is a productive worker. Milton produced Paradise Lost as a silkworm produces silk, as the activation of his own nature. He later sold his project for five pounds and thus became a merchant. But the literary proletarian of Leipzig, who produces books at the behest of his publisher, is pretty nearly a productive worker since his production is taken over by capital and only occurs in order to increase it. There's a problem here. Hollywood is not Leipzig. Robinson's hell may have been cranked out factory style under salary, um, um, uh, uh, but uh, at the behest of his, uh, 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 but as long as it remains circling the table caught in a bad infinity, not only will it earn less merchants capital than Milton's hell, 
it can't even be socially validated as possessing value, at least not if one follows Michael Heinrich's argument that the whole circuit of capital from production to realization is what retrospectively confirms the presence of value creating abstract labor and not some embodied crystal of value inserted during production. And yet there's hope in that word retrospectively. Robinson was a salaried employee of a factory that has been unable to sell its product, yet. Someday he might switch on Netflix and find himself confirmed as value creator and productive laborer. But careful what you wish for Robinson. As Marx says, to be a productive laborer is not a piece of luck, but a misfortune. Uh, uh, Robinson liked to play. He played basketball. He played tennis. He spent a great deal of his time playing in plays and some time working in plays, an odd conjunction of play and work. For example, Robinson was paid to play Montano, governor of Cyprus, in Othello, and also offered a salary to play Iago in another Othello. He played Hamlet, Hotspur, and Richard II for free. Played Macbeth in a run that his capitalist producer he also funded. Yet in every case, the work he did to play the role was identical. He would A, read the play, B, highlight his lines in the text, C, memorize them, D, learn the blockings, E, rehearse with fellow actors trying out various actions in the scene. And so on. In some cases, he was valorizing value, in others not. But always from his own perspective, he was engaging in a kind of play that had engaged him since childhood and that other forms of work took him away from. He once wrote out a list of every job he'd ever held, wanted to see if there was a kind of pattern or, and that linked acting to office work or wine cellar to Steve, or, or stevedore or translator, telephone lineman, laborer, or whatever. An observer from Mars who watched Robinson at work in any of these jobs would have seen him perform a series of concrete actions, sorting, filing, sanding, throwing, tasting, pushing, lifting, pulling, etc. And yet any one of these metabolic exchanges with nature could have been productive or unproductive, might or might not have generated surplus value, which is another way of saying phenomenology won't help us here, that we need critical theory to unravel mediation by mediation, the social form of any activity, its location in the valorization circuit the links between what is observable and what is not. 15, Robinson was working part-time in the financial district. When the working day ended, as the office staff restored to life, bustled and schmoozed its way through the front door, Robinson and his three colleagues would begin their five to nine shift, alone, among a wilderness of desks, unsupervised except by one another. On St. Patrick's Day, his two New York Irish female co-workers called in sick. The task of filing the day's transactions fell to Robinson and his deskmate, Sal from Bensonhurst. Moments, write David Harvey, are the elements of profit. If four workers can sort X number of papers in four hours, how many hours will it take two to accomplish the same task? Eight is the wrong answer. It doesn't take into account the social reproduction of the worker. What was usually a four-hour sprint with snack and bathroom breaks squeezed in had suddenly become, at the very least, the long marathon of a full eight-hour day with its requisite eight-hour lunch, hour lunch break, and in this case, dinner, which in this case happened to be at a bar called the Barney Stump, Blarney Stone, perhaps not the best choice on St. Patrick's Day in New York. They finished sorting all the papers at 8.30 in the a.m. and hung out until 9 to report their hours to an astonished office manager as he arrived along with co-workers who had waved goodbye to them at 5 p.m. the previous evening. So answer to the math problem, it takes two people 16 hours each. 16. Let's check the calculations. Socially necessary labor time is the labor time which is necessary on average to produce a commodity. In other words, it's socially necessary. But live time is not homogenous. The body slows it down or speeds it up. Work goes quickly in hours one to four, less so in hours four to eight, less so after midnight, meaning an obligatory second food grape which turned into breakfast at Bickford's. Robinson documented his hours claim through rational reconstruction, omitting the descent into Blarney Stone time where three hours literally disappeared. Now, according to Marx, office work belongs to the category of unproductive labor, work necessary to capital's reproduction that simply superintends or maintains value created elsewhere but doesn't add any surplus value. In, in, in fact, Robinson and Sal created surplus value for the temporary agency that employed them since they were paid maybe half of what the agency got from the business that outsourced the work which of course was revenue deducted from the surplus that the business had created, leaving the total, total, total surplus value unchanged. Here's the anomaly. The slower Robinson worked, the more hours he clacked, the more he dozed off, the more coffee he drank at Bixford's, the more Gaelic songs he sang in glasses of whiskey he raised in the drunken epicenter of Irish New York, the more surplus value he created behind his own back, as Michael Heinrich would put it. Here's the last section. It's not the last section, but the last one I'll do. Bottom line, it appears that Robinson, drawing from his own experience, wants to conduct some kind of inquiry about work. What makes his project so peculiar is what it leaves out. 
Capitalism, says Ellen Wood, begins not with the offer of work, but with the imperative to earn a living. Precisely. What's missing from Robinson's account is compulsion, the risible so-called freedom to work or starve that capital offers anyone caught in its grip, the precarity of existence that so many experience. What's missing is the struggle over time, the harness that ties the time of the body to the time of capital, the time of heightened exploitation and technological speed up. What's missing, in short, is capitalism. Robinson and his friends from the 60s lived in the dying afterglow of an unprecedented boom. In the lazier capitalism of those prenatal neoliberal days, they gravitated by instinct to the jobs that didn't advance the accumulation process, the unsubsumed non-capitalist residues, the pockets of barter and artisanship. They were mostly white privileged. They accepted jobs if they needed them without ever earning a living. And in the absence of a vast reserve army of labor, they were able to find those jobs at will or enroll in a university with almost free tuition. They didn't have careers, they had serial lives, actor, teacher, carpenter. Every job they took was an audition, except it was the job being auditioned. Is this what I'd like to do for the next 40 years? Is there anything I'd like to be doing that long? Will it challenge me? Was I put on earth to do this? In communist society, writes Marx, where nobody is one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes, society regulates the general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another to tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, wear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. In some ways, Robinson and his friends were living pr prematurely as if communist society had already arrived. <laughs> or if that trope seems too preposterous, it can be scaled down. One could argue that their quest for a new ratio between free time and work mirrors what might result from universal basic income and help us map a post-work future. Or one could ask, what possible relevance can an inquiry into the work lives of these mostly white privileged people have in an era of e ever escalating austerity catastrophic climate change, of whole populations deemed surplus consigned to a planet of sums, of the becoming black of the world. And I'll leave out the thing about volunteer labor in Chile, which is the last thing. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Oh, wonderful. Um, three terrific papers. And um, you might have looked at the time and, and noticed that we only have uh, according to the schedule, uh, something like 11 minutes left. But I think one hour for lunch is sufficient, so we can cut into that one hour and 15 minute uh, block that we've allocated. So um, there's, there's going to be plenty of time for uh, questions and comments. Just a, a, a quick uh, comment tr um, to try and bring these uh, three talks together. Uh, I think that the, um, uh, the, the, the point that that you're making, um, Philip, is a, is a good one uh, from which to jump into uh, a discussion, sort of looking at sort of pre-neoliberal forms of, uh, of, of work as almost anticipating something like what um, communism uh, might, um, uh, might look like. Uh, that also seems to, to, to work with this kind of um, dialectic at, at play in um, uh, in Johann's talk about the, the manifest and latent uh, forms of association. Um, and I think Marx is especially uh, um, sensitive to that, um, that dialectic in, uh, in a number of writings, as Johann was already suggesting, um, that the very nature of um, industrial capitalism led to um, forms of uh, association that um, really did lead to a certain kind of collective subjectivity of, uh, uh, of, of the workers of the proletariat, which contributed to what Marx called creating the, the, the very grave diggers of, of capitalism. This is what he thought the bourgeoisie was, um, a, a, a Frankenstein-like character who was uh, essentially uh, producing the very, um, the very monster that was going to um, uh, overthrow it. But I think that things have, have changed considerably since then. And one of the, the things that many uh, social critics have been uh, focused upon is what's called the financialization uh, of everyday life, the colonization both of space but also of time, of the future, uh, by, um, by money capital and by finance. Uh, and this is something that, uh, amongst others, I mean, um, 
uh, Maurizio Lazzarato talks about. And this has um, a, a profound effect in terms of the production of political subjectivity, both at the level of the conscious uh, um, uh, uh, um, kind of activity, but also the unconscious as well, that, that debt and guilt go hand in hand. And that's what financialization ultimately is. It's, it's about, um, it's about uh, increasing indebtedness to the point where we can't even imagine a, a kind of future, because um, the future simply looks like debt bondage. It looks like simply paying back uh, all of the thousands of dollars that people incur when they're in uh, uh, institutions like this of higher education, of course, in the States, it's, uh, it's at a different level altogether. So I think that that really um, uh, exemplifies in a way our, our current uh, predicament. And, and I think this is precisely, I think, where, where Duane's paper comes in that's quite, quite interesting insofar as the, the, the dynamic of automation, the increasing uh, technification of labor, um, the uh, increasing reliance on things like uh, artificial intelligence um, and robotics leads to um, the strange sort of uh, moment where um, the crisis tendencies of capitalism, this is negativity, uh, the crisis tendency of capitalism isn't simply going to disappear. Um, and you know, one of the dimensions of that is, of course, the problem of under uh, consumption, right? And then I think the Heinrich here is so very important because v value isn't realized uh, un until that moment of consumption, right? So that it has to, to traverse the entire circuit. series and circuit of, uh, of, uh, of capitalist uh, expanded reproduction. Right? So that doesn't happen in a context in which, I don't know that it's, eight, I think, uh, you know, not necessarily 80%, 80, 80%, but they said between 45 and 50% of the jobs that exist today are no longer going to exist in, in 20 years. So what happens? You have to start thinking about these universal uh, uh, benefit schemes so people can actually live lives that are productive. Productive also in terms of their ability to consume. Not for capital. Right. But there's also the possibility of this becoming black of, uh, of, of, of the world, which means increasing disposability. We're on the, we're on the kind of brink of uh, you know, going in, in either direction. I think this is you know, quite an important political moment now. So I, I just like to throw it open. I think these are the stakes of these papers, and I think they really work very well together. Um, there's no real question in there, but if, if the panelists would like to uh, address that, they can. Otherwise, we can go straight to the audience. I just want to address, uh, maybe bring up some of the discussion points that were discussed on Tuesday, too, and the uh, discussion between proponents of basic income and uh, John Clark and uh, one other that um, very cautious, actually quite negative about the possibility. And, and uh, for me, I totally understood the understood those, um, them being cautious. And I think Samir just br brought this up as well, too. There are two ways that this can go, I think. Um, if we do end up in a situation where there simply isn't enough demand, enough workers, uh, um, you, could, uh, you could envision a, um, a basic income uh, scheme that ties in really well with neoliberal um, strategy and goals. Uh, that basically serves to supplement uh, the labor cost, basically, of, of different companies so that they end up getting workers for, for cheaper and decide rather than investing in, in new capital, it's actually cheaper to invest with the assistance of the government in cheaper labor. So there's all sorts of uh, issues that we have to really be careful about. Um, the, from my vantage point, I still see the emancipatory potential of a, of a well-designed program. I think it may, we, we may need to uh, implement it in stages. Um, but I also see it as possibly a, a, wedge, a wedge issue, and that's where the, um, uh, the uh, emancipata emancipatory potential comes in. I, I, I think it's a distinct possibility that once people experience that free time um, and, and have an opportunity to feel like they have choices in life, and that they can express express themselves in different ways. I think there's a very real potential that that could that can then become a, a political movement. I might be naive in this. I'm not sure, uh, but a political movement to actually demand more uh, in the future as well too. But again, it, it totally depends on how those initial um, BI uh, plans are are instituted. Uh, which way we go with that? So do you see that as being ideologically driven? One and 
the necessity of having the state uh, to be proactive on, uh, on behalf of the citizens. Uh, it means you've got to populate the state with it, people and institutions will have to be changed to accommodate you know, the needs of the people. So th this, um, there's a joining that must take place between the people and the state. Mm -hmm. So that there is a larger buy-in, people buy into the idea. So you see the state is really being transformed from what we've got today. What is the role of the state? In what the is the role of the state? Yeah. yeah. So institutions. Uh, right. So again, we have to be careful. There's also BI plans being uh, planned by uh, uh, those in Silicon Valley. Um, uh, private firms wanting to, to get in on this as well, too. Um, I'm very skeptical of their motivations, obviously, behind this. But I think the state has a role to play, at least in the, in, in the, in the beginning, in order to uh, establish these schemes. It's very complex. It's very complex in terms of how you fund these schemes, right? Um, a neoliberal version would see it as a, because Milton Friedman was one of those who believed in uh, another version called negative taxation. Uh, and he saw it as an opportunity to basically do away with as many social existing social programs as possible, uh, basically to save save money and reduce actually the size of the state. Okay. I like to see if, uh, Philip and, yeah, and I was going to say, I, you know, I like the way you go back to Keynes, uh, and particularly Jeff Mann's book on Keynes, which is great, uh, where we start with the notion of Keynes not as someone who wanted to save capitalism, as Negri put it but as someone who wanted to save what he thought of as civilization, and he thought capital, he, had, he had to save capitalism in order to do that. Um, and it's hard to imagine now how, growing up in the 50s, the whole notion of having arrived at the affluent society, as Galbraith said it, or the leisure society, and this notion of what are people going to do, where Keynes' uh, essay, Economics, Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, which reads now, uh, as news from ideological antiquity, uh, <laughs> would talk about working 15 hours a week and, and the notion that we, uh, we have our basic needs satisfied and these relative needs will, uh, will be uh, uh, easy to give up after we're educated. And, and what Keynes misses understanding, really, and this is odd for an economist, is he doesn't seem to understand capitalism. <laughs> It's obviously not there to provide for needs of people, like use values and so forth. It has its own needs, which are to expanded reproduction, or MCM prime. So by not inscribing that in his picture of the future, he can't portray why his particular utopia gets overturned at the point where stagnation comes about and capital sort of needs to keep accumulating mm. and things start being jettisoned overboard again and again okay. uh, until we arrive at some sort of neoliberal, neoliberal moment. Okay. So, the, yeah, there's another uh, discussion as well, uh, and, and that's the, the discussion around, in, in, it was very important political, uh, political science and sociology uh, in the 80s and 90s, and there's a new social movement so raising these so-called post-material values, right? And that, that's part of this. And the emergence of the green movement, for example, is understood in these terms. So yeah, good. Um, Johan, would you like to, to come in and, and respond, and then we'll open it up. Um, yeah, it's not always so easy to follow the discussion yeah. from um, afar, but I think um, what I would just like to differentiate, um, in Duane's paper, excellent paper, by the way, um, I think the main focus would be on the question of how to distribute work and thus leisure time. Um, and that's, of course, very important. But I think my focus was a little bit more about how to organize or reorganize production. Yeah? And uh, I'm not saying that these are exclusive perspectives, but it might make sense to keep them apart to some extent, because the organization of production, uh, the way in which the collective worker is being staged in a society, either indirectly through the market or to some extent by uh, forms of organization that uh, give it some visibility. Yeah? I think this is a different style of politics that is also um, not directly um, 
in dialogue with um, these, in any case, state-mediated forms of uh, UDI. Yeah. So I'm just trying to keep some of these political paradigms that we have uh, in this discussion um, separate. Yeah. I mean, again, they might be one. One could think them together, and one could probably think of um, alliances in, in, in certain contexts. But it might also also make sense to keep uh, the, the differences. Um, yeah, in mind. Just my association. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now, um, you have a question, and then Anita. Yeah. Um, this is a question about uh, the theoretical tenets of psychoanalysis that it might come very theoretical, but I think that it has um, real practical repercussions. Uh, when uh, Hartle is talking about uh, free association and the unconscious, I think that uh, one important aspect is that the unconscious comes um, in um, surprising traumatic uh, excerpts or disruptions, right? And I was wondering how um, we can think um, in, in I, I know that you are referring to specifically the collective associations of workers. But I was thinking how um, if we take the unconscious or unconscious associations, free associations, uh, as that that brings about the traumatic, the, the one that is not assimilated, the, the negativity, the impossibility, how um, that could be calling for a politics of uh, residual Right, like that thing that cannot be integrated, that who is outside, and maybe it's about the disabled, the unemployed, that is not uh, mm -hmm. considered in the in the movement of the workers. Uh, the other point was about Duan's uh, paper in terms of the uh, politics of pleasure, in a way, or this uh, homo, homo ludens. Uh, I love Marcus because he's very optimist, but at the same time. Um, and I think that Samir was uh, pointing out at the crisis tendency that exists, like that entropy in terms of the, the human and how much work, in a way, is, is necessary for channeling that, um, that entropic tendency of the drives um, in, into, into a symbolic uh, production that otherwise we couldn't be just uh, the the yeah the homo the homo ludens the the pleasure men because uh, apart from the reality principle and the pleasure principle is the excess the the tendency of always going into entropy so that's pretty much my question so we'll take another question from Anita thank you thank you for all the papers I really enjoyed this panel and my question is for Johan Hartel um, so I really uh, loved this idea of the kind of bringing together the Marxian version of association and the Freudian. Can you hear me over there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, okay. Because uh, this question is for you. Um, I love this idea of bringing together Marxian and Freudian association. And I think you talk about it especially as a way of, you know, use that quote from Jameson about the chain of hidden links that lead us to the sources of production itself. Um, but I was curious also if, um, you were thinking also about the perceptual ramifications of thinking through um, association in a Freudian way and bringing that together with the Marxian, um, in the sense that you know it's not the the idea of following that chain of hidden links is not in and of its it's it's something that will require different kind of forms of critique, I think, and I I wonder if you're thinking about that in a more perceptual way, as what association in the Freudian sense can can do for us there. And then I also related to that was wondering if, um, you know, that could also help to provide imminent sources for um, moving beyond the kind of solipsism of the neoliberal subject towards a more collective subjectivity. So I wonder if working through in that way of um, yes. using um, free association could start to um, find some of those sources, you know, or to build some of them. I don't know if that's clear. But yeah, we'll thank you. We'll take one a third question, and then uh, we'll see if we have some time left for some others. Thank you for all the three of the panelists. Uh, I have a question for Dwayne. Actually, I don't know if this is a question, but when you were talking, I had in mind Adorno's famous quote that he doesn't have free time. And whenever he's work, it's not a matter of free time for him, the work, whatever he does. So 
um, in that spirit, uh, could you respond whether or not that plays into what you are formulating as play or play as an ex like aesthetic existence? And how, or whether or not, if we have that kind of, if we have the Adornian understanding of not having a free time, then would a basic income really matter or not? Thank you. Okay, give it back to the panel. Um, can I address your question? Okay. Um. <coughs> So my understanding, uh, uh, that, that's a great question. My understanding of, uh, I refer a bit to Hannah Arendt's differentiation between labor and work as well too. So when I talk about free time, that's why I tried to make a distinction between how we traditionally think of today as leisure versus, versus true aesthetic, aesthetic work or play. So I think there's an element of getting lost in, getting lost in a particular activity when when it's not for a particular purpose that could take on the element of, and I think maybe that's what Adorno was getting at, take on the element of very um, uh, deliberate work. It's, it's work of a sort, but not necessarily for any outside sort of instrumental purpose. But yet it takes all of our energy, all of our intellect, and, and has embodied form perhaps as well too. So maybe that's how it could take on that, mm. the element of Purposefulness without purpose. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, who, who'd like to? Um, Johan, would you like to uh, respond to Anita's question to you? Yes. Um, uh, excellent two questions. I um, they helped me a lot in uh, seeing how much of a Lukacian I am. I um, without speaking too much about Lukács, but um, there's one beautiful sentence in Lukács' essays on realism. And this relates to the question of uh, Hilda huh? on, uh, the, on trauma and different forms of uh, poetically bringing to the fore, um, let's say, hidden latent structures, um, where Lukács says, in moments of crisis, the question of totality becomes fully evident. Yeah? And what does Lukács mean by that? The idea would be that whenever um, you're confronted with existential um, issues, existential moments of crisis, there can be no longer a question if there is such a, uh, such a thing like a hidden overarching structure, yeah, like the monetary system or so. And I think this is a very smart way of putting the question of how, um, let's say, um, latent structures can either articulate themselves in a, a apocalyptic, catastrophic, yeah, traumatic way, or in ways of, um, of poetic pro production that I would see in the structure of labor associations. Yeah? So this is um, another way of bringing to the fore the latent structure of social production that is normally, um, uh, let's say, concealed. And that's, that would be my answer or my attempt of, of uh, answering and relating uh, to the second question, the question of perception. Because um, what is the idea of collectivity and the social organization of work in um, the further history of uh, the critique of commodity fetishism. Yeah, and of course, Lukács will be central to this history um, again. The idea would be that there is a form of social production at stake, but it is hidden, it's concealed by the market, because on the marketplace, we all appear as individual commodity processors. And individual commodity processors do not relate to each other as producers of common goods. They do not relate to each other as social producers. Yeah? So there's a problem of visibility of um, this link that uh, also Jameson refers to, this linking of um, the forms of social production. So this would be the perception question or the question of ideology. And of course, the idea that we relate to each other on the marketplace is so very... Um, very orthodox, really, um, that we relate to each other on the marketplace as um, individual commodity processors is also a way of producing ourselves as individual subjectivities that basically foreclose or, again, conceal to themselves the way in which they are, in fact, social producers and socially linked, yeah? No atoms, but, um, um, yeah, but producers of a common world. And I think this is... Um, in, in the long run, also the way in which I would uh, try to make sense of neoliberal individualism as a form of a massive um, and massively uh, enhanced um, 
logics of, of, uh, of reification. So this would be my answer to these three layers of the two questions. All right. So it, it actually, the response is also to you, Philip, insofar as you need both a, a form of critique and a phenomenology, right? Right. I mean, uh, you know, this notion of cinematic montage as a way of uh, laying bare what is happening, or uh, the, the Lukács line about uh, a crisis reminds me of uh, the line which I don't remember exactly from the thesis on history about Benjamin. That's uh, the, the uh, a fragment grasped in a moment of danger, the tigers leap into the past, and so forth. Uh, there is some notion that by bringing these things together, as like Kluge does in his films or so forth, something mm. becomes evident, connections that one doesn't see. And, and the, the, the form of uh, it, it presents itself in individuality as is revealed as something else. Uh, getting back to the aesthetic dimension of play, of course, uh, my suggestion uh, in my piece, or was going to be, and I hadn't worked on it enough, is that in a certain way, uh, in this Keynesian boom time where one could pick and choose from certain things, uh, it was almost an aesthete's approach to work, uh, which of course is what makes it uh, both uh, inapplicable, it can't be generalized and extended, and yet also in the same way prefigurative in the sense that uh, Marx has in his notion of doing this and doing this. Why shouldn't everybody, either individually or collectively, be aesthetes in how they approach it, rather than uh, buying into one of these uh, notions like the dignity of a private sector job, you know, all the things that are concealed in, in phrases like that, that are essentially there to form you or subjectivization to do this kind of work of accumulation which capitalism needs to keep on expanding. So uh, ultimately, what I think one has to look at the aesthetic, a certain version of the aesthetics as a liberatory if one doesn't privilege it as a kind of a finer dimension that is only accessible to educated people, but becomes this notion of uh, as with things like the writer's school and so forth, finding new ways to do things cooperatively or anonymously so that they can, uh, you know, point the way to other forms of organizing. Mm. Uh, yeah, together. although you were right also to point to the privileged nature right. uh, of the individuals who'd be able to flip from, from right. job to job, you know. Uh, I think that's very important to keep in right. mind. Um, great. Well, I, I think this brings us to the end of our time. We can't steal any more into, into lunch because, you know, we're, we are materialists after all. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, we're, we'll return in an hour at 2 o'clock. And um, for those who are not familiar with the area, if you just go straight out um, onto Seymour Street, there's a Korean restaurant, uh, Donburi place, and then uh, up in the next block, there's a burrito place. It's pretty good. Uh, I ate there a fair amount. Uh, and there's a lot of other places. But just make sure you're back here by, by 2 o'clock. Um, I'd like to thank the, the panelists again, um, uh, Johan. Uh, um, Dwayne and, and Philip for terrific papers and thank you all for your, your, your input as well. And it's a shame Johan can't join us. <laughs> He'll be heading to bed soon. <laughs>